Welcome everyone to the Self-Publishing Roundtable episode number 49. We are extremely late because of some severe technical difficulties, but there wouldn't be a Self-Publishing Roundtable if we didn't have some of those. I am hosting tonight and my name is Carl Sinclair and I am joined as always by my good friend John Ward, uh, Wade Finnegan's avatar, and Kevin Michael, uh, who joined us last week as a special guest. He's actually going to be joining us on a permanent basis now. Um, Trish is MIA, and we think that might be because of the technical difficulties. And Dave's not here either. Um, so it's a fun start, but we do have a very special guest, Mr. Matthew Mather, who is a extremely successful science fiction author, and we are very happy to have him here to talk about his books, his launches, and his Shakespeare, uh, what, what, what would we call it? The Shakespeare system, I guess that's what it's called. Um, so I'll pass over to Kevin, who will give him a full intro, and then we'll hear from Matthew. All right, so uh, thank you for being on, Matthew. Uh, I guess the first thing is for people who don't know your books, um, how would you describe uh, Cyberstorm and the Atopia books? Well, Cyberstorm is a, um, uh, they're, they're two very different uh, books. Um, Cyberstorm is more of a tech thriller, kind of Michael Crichton, Tom Clancy-ish type of style, uh, where uh, Atopia is really more the, the classic hard science fiction, you know, near-term science fiction sort of uh, thing. So I've actually kind of got two series going, one in the Atopia series, which is, uh, which is now with 47 North, and then another series of tech thriller type books, which I'm just uh, about halfway. I've actually finished a sequel to Atopia, which is coming out on August 12th, and I'm about halfway through the follow-up to Cyberstorm, which will be coming out uh, in the fall. So yeah, they're two kind of. They're both science fictiony, but one of them's more, you know, the, the typical science fiction, and, and the other one is more tech thriller type type style. Yeah. Now, what I found interesting reading your author bio is that you worked at, I mean, maybe you still work at McGill at the, uh, that, that in the tech world at McGill. Yeah. So um, how much of that did you draw on to write Cyberstorm? Uh, well, I've, I've actually had a few different lives, uh, in working, working lives, I mean, not literally. But, um, you know, I, I started off working at... Um, uh, let's see. Actually, we we're just talking about Formula One this weekend in Montreal. Actually, when I got out of college, I worked for Formula One for a couple of seasons, uh, doing the being a roadie over there. And then I, after that, I started up a company where I worked with some guys at the McGill Center for Intelligent Machines, um, and uh, I did a tech startup where we did haptics, we did the sense of touch. Then I did uh, I did three or four more startups, and I worked with McGill Center for doing startups, and I actually worked in nanotechnology. Uh, computational systems, um, uh, electronic health record systems, um, and then I did a video game startup, um, and then at the end of all of that, I decided to write a book. So I have a very wide range of, I've actually worked in the technical field and everything from nanotechnology to, you know, online, I ran one of the Canada's largest online portals for a while once. So I have a lot of really background working in the tech field, and so I draw on a lot of that when I write the books. And I'd also, actually, the last couple of years, I've been working in the cybersecurity field, um, and so I actually still am on a board of advisors of one of Canada's biggest cybersecurity companies, go down to Washington to do presentations on cybersecurity. So I, I'm still sort of have those two lives, as many writers do, um, and I draw on all of that stuff when I'm writing the books. So since you work in cybersecurity, I guess one of the questions would be, how, how worried should the rest of us be? about the future. <laughs> you know, the, the problem there is you don't want to be fear-mongering. You call it, um, in, in the business, you call it FUD. You know, the, the FUD, which is the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And there's a tendency to try and rely on the FUD factor, you know, to, to try and get people to do things. But the problem is that people turn off after a while. Like, you try and scare them, and it's, you know, the, the, the boy who <laughs> cried wolf. You know, it's, it's exactly that. You keep on doing it, and people will stop listening. And so you need to... So I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to say that people should be too worried, but they're definitely, you know, there's a, um, uh, in the, the U.S. military, they like to talk about asymmetric warfare, um, you know, just, you know, the, the shock and awe and how you can overwhelm an opponent. The problem is in the cyber arena, you know, you know, it's, um, uh, the, it, the, the asymmetric actually comes the other way because the U.S. and the Western are, we're so plugged in 
and everybody wants to have their bank account online and they want to have access to everything instantly at your fingertips, but then they also want to have everything absolutely secure. And those two things are, are, are competing. Um, and we haven't had any major cyber incidents. There's been a few instances of, of cyber warfare that have happened, um, you know, and I could go through and detail some of those, but it's definitely, it's going to happen. Like, uh, I'm surprised even that, that the bad guys haven't latched onto it. I could show you how to hack into, you know, like, a, you know, hack into something. And I could show my grandmother how to hack into something on an afternoon, you know, download, you know, a, a free shareware, you know, thing to go and do an exploit. And, uh, you know, it's a very easy thing to go and, uh, and do, and I'm surprised the bad guys haven't done it yet. So. Well, let's well, hope yeah. that they don't catch on yet. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. we'll, save, we'll, save it talk one, we'll, we'll save it for off the air, probably. Let's, let's not make that <laughs> yeah. easier for them. Let's try to make it harder for them. But, but it, would be, guess, uh, it would be terrifying, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's why Cyberstorm is, was such a resounding success, because you tapped into that, that market that everyone has and that fear that this could really happen. Um, and I know, I know I worry about that. Everyone I know worries about that. You know, but I don't worry about it that I'm not going to go shopping and use a credit card, though. I'm not, I got to get money from somewhere, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, and, and part of the goal was when I, when I go to my cybersecurity conferences, you'd have all the experts would be saying, well, everybody understands that all the networks are owned. You know, an attacker can get into any network, and, and they understand the implications of cyber warfare. Whereas when I talk to the, the public, nobody understood what the implications were would be and so one of my goals in writing Cyberstorm was to say okay if you actually did have a major cyber event here's what the implications would be and, and here's you know a show and don't tell kind of thing um, and, I, and I've actually gone and talked at cybersecurity conferences where I've um, you know talked about the book and the, 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 the least expensive way to do um, uh, cybersecurity actually is through awareness just telling people to change their passwords and do all that sort of stuff and I think one of the goals of the book was to wake people up a little bit and say the responsibility for cybersecurity isn't just on the government and the corporations, it's firmly on your shoulders and people need to take more responsibility and hopefully have helped push the rock along a little bit at the same time as, as having a, you know, a, a best-selling book. Uh, so I think it's, it, when I write, I like to have those two goals, to have something that's entertaining but also something that's educational at the same time. Well, I think one of the great things about your career is that you actually have a career that most writers are really jealous of and they aspire to. You sold hundreds of thousands of copies. You have a movie deal. Um, you, you do have some traditional publishing thrown in also for foreign stuff. Um, yeah. You've had, you've had amazing success, and you did it. Uh, I remember seeing your blog post that you have a Shakespeare method. Do you want to describe what that is? Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. So the uh, so the Shakespeare is just an acronym. I was trying to think of something clever to um, um, you know as a way of encapsulating it and, and describing it. Um, and really, that uh, when I when I published my first book, I had a lot of people came to me and said, "How did you do it? What did you do?" Um, and the first thing that I'm going to say though is that you know, every, you know, when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so I come from sort of the entrepreneurial world, and I have a certain way of of doing things and so you know I came up with kind of a system of, of how I tried to launch my books and, and and so I came up with all these things like I serialized my content instead of putting out one big story I put it into smaller chunks just because I think if people's attention spans are shorter and so to try and draw them in and hook them into the story and then using all of your networks like your Facebook obviously but LinkedIn your work networks and uh, uh, and, and just uh, and something else that kind of goes counter to what a lot of other people had said um, I said to focus for instance just to focus on Amazon when you start out because uh, not that I'm you know in, in love with Amazon in any way although they, they do a very they're being done something very powerful recently but uh, when you're doing anything entrepreneurial, you always need to focus, focus, focus. You need to find a beachhead, and once you get that beachhead, then you can you can you can expand outwards from there. And so, really, I was saying, you know, I was drawing up a set of guidelines, saying, you know, focus on one specific thing. You know, do these things, get your reviews, make sure you engage with your readers. It's just sort of a, a laundry list of things uh, to do when a new author is 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 putting a book out. And I'm no by no means an expert. I just managed to do it my way and said, here's how I did it. Hopefully, that could be helpful. When you uh, you f when you're finding your readers at the beginning, what do you think was the key there to? Because it seemed like you didn't take you too long to find them. What, what were some things you focused on there? 
Um, well, the way that I launched it, I, I, I did this fairly, um, I actually, I, I created my first book um, as a set of five side quills. So they're five, five stories that happen simultaneously in time, but they all start at the same moment in time. Um, and they all ha happen in parallel. And I actually put all five of those stories up on Amazon. Um, and then once every two weeks, I did a free promotion on, on one of them. And so people could get into the story, but they didn't have to do it sequentially. They could jump in at any point. And then once they jumped in at one point, I was selling the whole thing. And so I did this whole funnel thing where I created all of these five stories and then kept promoting them as free books, but then had the other books they could buy and put them all together. And so that was how I uh, started the ball rolling. It was just a, a, a system, I guess, that I came up with. And it was, it was very effective because every time I did a, a free promotion weekend, I would get – you know, five, 7,000 people would download the free book. And then every week I would have the next book would be free and I would just keep on rotating it. And so you started to create this funnel of people that were coming into the story. And then you had the, the sixth story actually tied all five stories together. So it was kind of a clever way of, 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 of funneling readers in. That's, that's, that's how I did it. That yeah. was a word I was just going to use, clever. That's, that's a very clever idea. <laughs> It, it, and I've, I've tried to suggest it to other people, but it, it's really hard to write a story where you've got five simultaneous stories going on and each one's encapsulated and, you know, it's, but it, it works, you know, it worked, it worked anyway. Carl, you had a question? Um, yeah, I, I, when we originally booked you on, because we were going to have you on about a month ago, but some stuff came up and you couldn't make it, uh, when I was looking through your website, um, I saw you mentioning uh, Craigslist to to do something yeah. with your book launches, uh, and I've never heard anyone talk about Craigslist with regards to book launches before. But you had some pretty successful ones, so I was kind of interested to see what it was you did with them and how it was involved with your launches. Yeah, I've had a few other writers actually since I suggested that that have gone out and done it. And so what I suggested with Craigslist was. One of the hardest things when you're starting out as a writer is to get people that are not, you, you've got your friends and family, but they're not arm's length and they don't necessarily want to read all your stories, right? So I was saying, how could I get people that are, you know, arm's length from me who I could get to read my books and give me feedback? Um, and so I went onto Craigslist and I said, look, I'm a starting out author. I've got a book. I would like people to give me honest uh, feedback on what they think of it. Um, and so I said, I'll pay you $25 for anybody that reads my book. And, um, and you know, um, uh, just to give me, just to give me arm's length feedback on what you liked, didn't like, what made sense. These aren't people you know, so, but they're, you know, and so I actually ended up getting like 30 or 40 people, uh, which cost a little bit of money, but now I had 30 or 40 people that started to give me feedback. And then interestingly, this started to create the sort of the nexus or the, the nodal, I don't know, the center point of, these people that were interested in helping me and giving feedback, and then when I put the stories up, these people went in. I, you know, they went in of, of their own volition and and wrote reviews and started to tell their friend. And they started to Facebook and tweet for me, and um, and so it, it's it was a way of, of getting the ball rolling without you know of finding that first group of people. Um, uh, so that's and I've had a few other writers do that. They've had the same thing. It's hard finding people at arm's length and, and they've gone on Craigslist and all of a sudden they've got 30 or 40 people that are reading their stuff and, and giving them feedback and, and it's very um, empowering also because now all of a sudden you've created this four momentum um, with these arm's length people that you didn't have before. You know? So it, 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 it does work. Now when you say Craigslist, did you put it on the job section under writing or did you put it under... Like what section? Because there's about a hundred sections on Craigslist. <laughs> I think I put it. I think I put it under like other or something. You know, it's sort of like the big. Uh, I think I posted it in like New York and and my local one in Montreal uh, when I was here in Montreal and, and just you know because it, it doesn't matter where they are. Uh, it's just you know, are you you know an avid reader and would you like to help out a starting out writer and and you know and I'll pay you twenty five bucks and that was yeah I can't remember which section it was but one of those uh, sections but it does work. You know, it's, did you uh, say you gave out paperbacks, or did you give out e-copies? No, just e-copies. Okay. Yeah, paperback things would be too difficult to, uh, you know. I do yeah, every, I was, I was everything saying. through electronic. Yeah, yeah. But pe people are amazingly, you know, the people are really interested in just trying to help out. It's amazing the the, the support I've gotten from from people. Now, when you say uh, you started out, you said to only focus on Amazon, but now that you're a bestseller, um, how much are you going to branch out um, with your other future books into Barnes & Noble or Kobo or Apple or 
all the different platforms? <laughs> well, you know, the interesting thing is, um, as of right now, I probably will branch out uh, more. I actually branched out and did Kobo and did all of those, uh, and that, that works uh, really well, but I had the people from uh, Kindle Direct came to me and, and, and said, well, if you do it just with us, we'll do some extra promotions and things for you. And I've been earning an extra 30 or 40% through the Kindle uh, lending library, and then, um, you know, I've been making a lot of money through that. So right now I've actually just kept everything on Amazon just because they've been um, – They've been. They've done a lot of promotions for me, and they've just really. I have a, a close relationship with the people there, so it just really worked out well for me. Um, but I do think at some point I do need to to branch out further from that. You know, th that being said, I do have. Um, I, I've gained a. An, I have an agent in New York. I work with um, um, Janklo Nesbitt, um, and they've sold so far. I think fifteen or sixteen foreign language contracts for my books. Uh, and so I do have, you know, Penguin and, and, and HarperCollins, whatever, are publishing my books in Canada and Germany and France. And, you know, and, and so I do have, and so that's actually getting the books in a lot of different, in a lot of different places. But just for the online U.S. domestic market, I'm, I'm sticking on Amazon right now. Now, if you don't mind me asking, because um, it's maybe a little personal, because people don't like talking about sales, but when Amazon approached you uh, saying we'll do some extra stuff if you stay and select, were you at a certain sales threshold at that point? or? Well, that was more, uh, I was already, uh, yeah, I'd already sold 100,000 copies of Cyberstorm or something around, uh, around that point, um, something like that. It, Cyberstorm, when it caught on, it really, it really caught on. Uh, and sold a lot of copies. Like when something caps on on Amazon, you can sell, you know, huge amounts of copies of it if it if it gets up there in the charts. So it just caught on, and then I had a discussion with them, and they wanted to. Uh, and and also I um, sold the Atopia series to Forty Seven North, so I you know I was just having a big Amazon love fest by that point. So yeah, that, that's um, what was going on. It's just going back a, a couple of steps. What you were saying about the the KDP and the lending library and stuff. It's it's funny you say that because a few um, quite a few science fiction authors that have done really well in the last couple of years have had similar results being in KDP and getting quite a bit of revenue from from borrowers. Um, and they, yeah, you know, Darren Wearmouth is one. I think you know Darren. Um, yeah, sure, I know Darren. Yeah. Um, so. That's interesting. Um, there's just a couple of questions on the website from uh, viewers, so I thought we'd hit some of those. Sure. Um, Michelle Reed, um, Jesus, heaps. Uh, Michelle Reed said, uh, where did it disappear to? They're moving so quickly. Uh, um, okay, so she said, so does Fiverr work the same way as Craigslist? Uh, I saw a bunch of people who are reviewing books professionally in exchange for a fee. Does that is that the same thing, or are you, does no, that count as no, buying reviews? No, or? no you, you can't you can't pay for reviews. Um, I was talking about getting uh, getting an arms length person to give you feedback. So um, actually, now that I have I have a few hundred beta readers that I work with. I, when I'm putting out a new book, I actually get them to give me feedback, and I create a, um, um, a kind of a, a crowdsource content edit. So I have. Uh, I'll get all the feedback from people and then start to categorize it and I'll get like a content edit that's, that's come from it. And so you can do the same thing when you're starting by getting readers uh, on Craigslist. Now, those people may decide of their own volition that they really like your work and they want to help and they're going to start to post things on Amazon and they, they, you know, they tend to, to do that. But if you, get, if you start to pay for reviews, that's a whole other thing and that's don't do that. I just... Uh, not only is it it won't make you feel good, but also Amazon is incredibly good at ferreting out all that stuff, and it will, you know, there's a whole bunch of negatives to doing that. And just my advice, just to not, not you don't you need don't. There's things there's services like Book Rooster. If you're trying to get reviews on your books when you're just getting started, that works pretty well. Where they send out your copy of your book to a couple of hundred people, and they will start to put. Uh, reviews up, and they will add a disclaimer saying, "I got a free copy of this book in exchange for giving an honest review." So that that sort of thing goes on, but paying for reviews on Fiverr is a very bad idea, and it one that won't work in the end, actually. Um, there's another uh, question uh, from Angela, fiction by Angela. She said, "If I use your Shakespeare method to publish a serial fiction project I'm working on, can I contact you for help?" Yes. <laughs> so it's not. <laughs> 
go ahead and yeah. contact. You can email me. I'm very, very happy to. Yeah, I, I, very happy to help out any way I can. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, That's awesome. <laughs> just you guys carry on. I'm just going through. There's so many comments. I'm just trying to. I actually, work I have a question topic. about your movie deal because I read that you optioned your your book mm -hmm. Cyberstorm to 20th Century Fox. Um, yep. How how involved are you with the screenwriter, or do they basically say we're going to do our own thing, or do they ask you questions on how you wanted it done, or because I've heard mixed mm -hmm. kind of things about working with Hollywood. Yeah, they they uh, they give you money and then they do what they want. Now, uh, to the extent if you know if they get into the production of it, uh, they may want to have me involved somehow. But really, it's uh, it's really hands off. You know they. They do their own thing. They, they, in exchange for them giving you some money, <laughs> that's for them to do whatever they want with the, you know, uh, with the material. Maybe if I was Tom Clancy or something, you might be able to put some. People say, "Why do you do that?" And you don't have any restrictions. I say, "Well, I'm just, I'm, you know, just you're just happy to get the attention." So, you know, that's uh, that, that's the deal you make. So you have no control. I guess is the short answer. Have you gotten any updates? Because it sold uh, about a year ago. Did you yeah. have you had any updates on whether it's being greenlit? Uh, I haven't had any updates. Uh, they did uh, Bill Kennedy from House of Cards. Uh, the, the only update I got was that he's doing the screenplay, and that was uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and so that's in process, and that's you know, uh, so that's a good sign. You know that uh, that's a really good sign. Screen. That's an amazing show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <I> see. <laughs> so that, that so that's a good thing. You know, probably the odds of getting greenlit are one in. I don't know, ten or something. I don't know what the you know, uh, even even with all that behind it, you know. Uh, um, so just just to be honest, I mean, it would be great if it happened. It'd be like winning a mini lottery, but yeah. With him yeah, writing okay. the screenplay, do you know if they're gonna kill a dog in the first scene? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? He said, if in the screenplay, do you know if they're gonna kill a dog in the first scene? <laughs> I I hope not. I've got three dogs, and I'd be very disappointed if they yeah yeah. That's I don't think it, it, I had any dog killing in Cyberstorm, though, is there? No. I think I know I had it. It's Hollywood. Seen House of Cards? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love House of Cards, actually. It's fantastic. The only problem is when they have the new season comes out, I spend one weekend watching all the episodes that yeah, barely get out of bed. Well. And then, yeah, so. Although yeah. I almost reconsidered after watching the first episode of the second season. That was a bit disturbing. But, um, yeah, that was a good show. And um, while on that... Uh, you obviously are hopeful that it's going to get made, but there are some signs that some of these projects are starting to get greenlit. Um, Pines is coming out as a series on Fox next year. Um, yeah. It uh, started off as quite a successful um, indie book. Um, yeah. Well, it, it would be very exciting, but, uh, you know, I'm, um, um, you know, I'm more tempered. You know, if it happens, that's amazing, but I'm, I'm not expecting it to. So, you know, just keep on plugging along and, and uh, you know, hopefully good things will keep happening. Now, do you have, is your agent trying to shop Atopia also for a film, or...? Yeah, well, I mean, I have a... So I have my, my sort of my main agent at Jankel and Nesbitt, and then I have a film agent uh, that's separate that does the Hollywood stuff, and they've, they've pitched Atopia. Atopia is a whole different ball of wax. It's... Uh, you know, it's it's dealing with endless virtual worlds, and you know, I, obviously, it's material that's been gone over, you know, in, in many different books and, and films. I have a bit of a different spin to it, but it's it, it would be challenging <laughs> to film in any way because it's so you know you're bouncing around from so many different worlds and things. It would it, it, you need you need somebody that was really into it to try and try and take it on. It's a very different sort of project. Yeah. But yeah, they're trying to. So we'll we'll see. Yeah. Now I'm reading over the Shakespeare method here, and one thing that I really love—it's not about selling books as much as it's about craft, but the whole yeah. em about empathizing and how you should introduce the character right away that the audience can get behind, that will lead them yeah. through the story. I think that's that's huge, and a lot of people don't don't appreciate that point as much. Yeah. Well, I have to say, in Atopia, my first main character is uh, somebody that everybody hates, and like she's not, she is not at all a likable person. And I'm amazed that the book actually, you know, generated any success. But uh, something I've learned from that is how much people, when they meet the main character, like that's 
if they don't empathize with them, you have a much, much harder um, road to travel than if you introduce, uh, you know, a likable main character that, that, that the reader can latch onto and, uh, and uh, you know, empathize with. And maybe that's obvious for people who are writers. I mean, I came from a background where I knew nothing about writing, so, um, uh, you know, I've learned as I've gone along, and I'm just sharing the things that I think that I've learned that were important, um, you know. So, but I guess when people come to writing, they come from all kinds of different backgrounds, and, you know, some things that I say, other people say, well, of course, everybody knows that, but... Uh, you know, I didn't know that, so, yeah. Matthew, I wanted to ask you, um, whenever you're um, introducing those characters and stuff and creating empathy like you're talking about, um, how do you balance the focus on introducing that character and letting people get to know the personality with um, the need for an explosion on page one so you catch the reader's attention <laughs> who likes to focus on the action side of the story? Yeah, well, I, I I struggle with that, you know, uh, as well. Um, you know, how do you? I think you really need to just you need to tell your story. You you want to be aware of the fact that you need to get that hook and the action and and get people into the story quickly, um, and then to the empathize with the characters. But then you also need to tell your story in the way that it needs to be told. You know, some. Uh, with Cyberstorm, some people, it, there's no, like, bang and explosion, like, right at the start. It's sort of, it's introducing you to the, you know, the, the introducing to the family and the, in the, you know, in the, in their apartment and, you know, the kids, and then things start to go wrong. And so people have to be a little bit patient to, to wait to things to go wrong. So that was just a way to tell the story, I think. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. That's just something that everybody kind of struggles with. And, you know, do you want to have the bang and crash and things, you know, going, or do you want to, you know, do you want to tell the story what you you want it to be told? And I think people will, you know, the thing is now that I have people that have already read my work, they they give you more lead, they give you more runway. So if the first twenty percent of the book they're reading into it and they're, you know, they don't quite get it and it's slow build, they'll give you that. Whereas if you're a starting out writer, you really got to hook them right away because they don't trust you that it's going to go anywhere interesting, right? So. You know, I think as a starting out writer, you need to uh, people out there. You need to really hook them fast and empathize and get all that stuff in short attention span and think about it like that. Whereas some of the books that people may love, their most loved books, really are slow to get into. But that's because you know the readers will give the the writer that they trust them enough to take that journey. So it's you know you can you really need to try and hook people and get them in quickly. I think if you're if you're just starting out. I'm blabbing a little bit there. Yeah. No, good no, no, no. point. Uh, we were just chatting in the chat to work out which subject we were going to hit you with next. Uh, I want to go <laughs> back right. to book launches a little bit because you've um, done pretty well with your launches and you talked a little bit about Craigslist and getting those yeah. that early feedback and then you got some reviews out of that. Um, could you talk a little bit? Uh, Cyberstorm came out first, correct? That was the uh, Utopia actually came out first in August of 2012, yeah. So, um, what specifically did you do with your launch? So, you got the book out. Uh, it went up. Uh, did you did you look at paid advertisements? Did you how did you price? Uh, and and what did you do to try and get that attention early on uh, on the store? Yeah. Well, when I launched Atopia, I actually have a um, uh, I planned it like a military campaign. I think I actually had uh, the launch day. Um, uh, so leading up to the launch day, I had a set of activities that I was doing every single day. And the day when I launched the book, I actually got up at 3 a.m., uh, put the book out, and then I started. I went and did things like I emailed personally every single person on my Facebook list, like not just a blanket thing, but actually went and did one email at a time saying, please go and download my book for 99 cents. Then I went through all of my 500 people on LinkedIn and did the same thing and, and did personalized emails. And then I went through and... Um, I, I did, you know, uh, I did five different press releases that I put out on the five different press release websites, and I put. So I went through. I had a list of about twenty different things that I just kept plugging away at, and and uh, yeah, and just kept doing it for about fourteen hours, just one thing after another, and just trying to get as. My goal was really to try and get as many people to download it on that day, so that the book would go up and uh, go up the charts. And actually, the day I launched Atopia, it went to number one on science fiction, uh, just because I. It's almost, I looked at it as like loading a spring. So I told all these people, like, it's going to launch on this day, and I kept on, but I didn't, like, this 
this pre-launch thing that goes on now. I'm not a, a, I've been talking with other people about it. You know, where the book is like available for a download beforehand. It creates this slow curve and then a soft launch and then a sort of a slow down. Um, I'm more of an advocate of, of, of not even doing that. So when I put a book out, I think I, if I self-publish, I'm not going to make it available a month ahead of time. I'm going to make it available two days before launch for, for some of my advanced readers to put reviews on. And then on launch day, I'm going to unload it and get you know a few thousand people to download it. And then it'll become the number one book in its category and get up, you know, and that'll get more eyeballs onto it. Uh, so I'm not a I'm not a big fan of this of this you know the pre-downloading thing because you you don't get a big bang right at the start and it won't get it right up in the charts. So that's that's my that's my thinking. Hey Matthew, um, how much pushback did you get whenever you emailed all of your contacts and all the different networks? Um, <laughs> have any of your friends say, hey, why are you spamming me with this stuff? Well, I'm you know you know. You get. I don't. I didn't get any pushback. Obviously, some people. You know, uh, if you email somebody once and say, "Hey, I've got a new book out," and you know, if they're on, either on your Facebook list or part of your LinkedIn, you know, these are people that you know. They're you know, they, even if it's is a casual acquaintance, um, emailing somebody once and saying, "I've got a new book out. Would you download it?" Now, if you email them five or ten times and keep bugging them about it, I would think that would be you know, you're going to get pushback, but. You know, if if you have even you know even no matter how tenuous the the relationship is, um, to say that I've got a new book out and I you know come and download it for ninety nine cents today, I don't think is too much of uh, you know an imposition. But that that's something that people have to you know have to um, judge for themselves. But you know, I, I, you know when you're when you're a self published author and you're getting out, you're 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 a salesperson. You know, you're you're you have to go out into the uncomfortable position of putting yourself in front of people and demanding attention a little bit. So you don't want to spam people, and you don't want to like you know be buying reviews on Fiverr or whatever. Like those are things you don't do. But yes, to go and try and get in people's face a little bit, and and to use all the networks. You know, uh, you know, can you do an email to all the people on your work network? Can you ask your boss, would it be okay if I sent out a general email to all 500 people at my company? If you work at a big company, you know, can you do? Think about all those things, and you're going to have to go a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe you're not used to being a salesperson, but you are going to need to be a salesperson when you do this. You know, so you're going to have to you're going to have to cross that line a little bit. Not too much, but a little bit. You know, get a little outside your comfort zone. Now, one question is: You did all this pre-launch stuff, and then you hit people really hard on on launch day. We had a question in the comments from uh, Demelza Carlton, who's wondering: You said you got to uh, number one in sci-fi really quick. Uh, is is it okay to ask how many copies uh, you were selling the first month? Uh, sure. I think uh, when I launched Atopia, I think I sold like I think I sold about a thousand copies the first day uh, that wow. it went live. And was that at ninety nine uh, cents or two ninety nine or three? Yeah, that was at ninety nine cents. And, and I also go opposite. See, people put their books at a high price and then lower their price afterwards. <laughs> I don't know. When I put my book out on launch day, launch window, I put it at ninety nine cents and I try to get as many people. Like I'm happy if you know a few thousand people download it on the first day at cheap. But I view that as now a few thousand people have got my book, they're going to read it, and then the word of mouth is going to generate. If I mean, you have to assume that people are going to like it. If they don't, then you know, then that's a whole other that's a whole other discussion. But assuming that they like it, now you've got a few thousand people on launch day that have, have downloaded at a good price, and 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 I put a I I usually put a thing at the end of the book saying thank you for downloading it, and you know I, I that you got the copy at ninety nine cents and and at a cheap price, and in in return if you could leave a review, I'd really appreciate it. I just stick stuff like that at my end of my books, and people will write reviews and then tell their friends about it, and you know, and it creates. This, this positive momentum sort of stuff. So I kind of I put it as cheap as I can, like the first launch week, to go out, try and get this initial. I mean, imagine like rolling a snowball down a hill. You don't want to like have a little snowball that you're getting for you know 4.99. I'm like, put it as cheap as I can, get as many people download as I can, get the snowball going, and then let it go. You know, and then charge you know the money for it. That's the that's the way I see it. That's How great. How are you on social media? Uh, I've got, I've got like 2,200 some odd. I don't know on on Facebook, uh, Facebook. But I'm not active on social media. I don't know. I'm not uh, in person. I'm fairly gregarious, but I I don't haven't <laughs> to be honest. And I, I just haven't quite. I'm not. I mean, I I I'd known Hugh before he became the famous Hugh, like when he was still you know getting it. But he just seemed to 
he's got he seems to, I don't know what he does but he just really latches he does really good in, in, in interacting with people and I just don't have that I haven't figured out my online persona or whatever so I still have you know I'll put out things if I put out something about my book I'll get like 200 likes on it or something and you know I've got I keep I you know I, I keep people a little bit involved in my life or whatever but I haven't quite figured out social media to be honest I yeah I'm not I haven't been very good with it I'd like to be better if anybody has any suggestions, <laughs> I'm all ears. <laughs> just you should do that, so. you should do group hangouts like you Howie used to do. You used to get like nine fans in a group hangout and just let them ask oh, yeah. them questions, and then you televise it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I should. Uh, that would be. I should do that. That would be fun, actually. I'm mean, I'm planning on doing more of it as I. Right now, I've been anyway. Is it, you know, I've been trying to get a, a new book out and I'm trying to get this out, and all these things seem, seem to, to get in the way. But <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to do more of that. Good idea. You um, you talked a little bit about press releases as part of the uh, launch strategy, and I've heard yeah. a few people talk about that in the past with varying degrees of success. Uh, you obviously did extremely well on day one, selling close to a thousand books. Um, how how did you go about? doing that and why did you go down that route and do you still think that that's useful? Um, kind of just a little bit of background on where it came about, I guess. Uh, I, I think that tr a traditional PR for a book is really uh, not going to work. <laughs> so when I say that I did press releases, it was like, it, it was, you know, point twenty of, of 30 different things that I did on that day. So I created, you know, four or five different variations on press releases and then put them out on the free press release websites. Um, did it get anything? You know, it's the 99 cent book launched about this topic, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. But some of those things actually, they create websites and then, and, and, or they, they create web URLs with the story on it. And maybe it gets you 10 or 20 extra people who download it by doing all of that work. But for me, that's 10 or 20 more people on launch day that download. And then I go on to point number 21 where I've got, you know, uh, you know, I do something else. And by adding all those different things together, you end up with, you know, hundreds of people that will download it on the first day and then it'll jump up in the charts. The, the other thing that I, and a lot of people probably talk about it, but the recommendation system on, on Amazon, I think if you give it a shock, like if you hit it really hard and you say all of a sudden the book goes from nothing to a thousand people downloading it in, in one day, then the recommendation system latches onto that and will recommend it to other people that have suddenly downloaded the book, and it creates it's just no, the, the snowball metaphor. I think uh, actually is is pretty powerful. Now I have a question about the Shakespeare system again. Uh, the first S is for serialization. Um, yes. So if you if you're a new author just publishing, or maybe you know you've had trouble with your previous books, would you recommend then writing? When you say serialization, do you mean like 50-page stories at a time, or like 100 pages at a time? Um, I was I well, I was thinking about things in word count. So um, you know, 10,000 words, which is sort of a long short story, uh, which would be what 40 pages, I guess, if I was going to use 250 words a page. Um, that's sort of big enough to be a story, and also small enough to be bite-sized. Uh, and my first Atopia story was 10,000 words, and the first Wool story. Um, was about the same size uh, also, so I copied a little bit what Hugh was doing there. Um, it was right after Hugh had done that, and I said, why don't I try that, and, and, and it worked. Um, but each one of those stories needs to be completely encapsulated. It can't just be like, you know, a book that stops at page 50. It needs to be an entire story in itself that ends at the end of that thing that leads into another story that starts from there. Um, so it is challenging to try and write short stories that have an entire story structure, you know, inside of there that leads into a larger story structure. But I, I do think that doing that and, and making something really interesting that gets people's attention will, you know, they're not going to have to trust you for a whole, you know, 100,000 word book. They could just do a 10,000 word short story. And then if they get a little bit of, oh, that's interesting. I like that. Then they'll continue on, you know. So that, that's, but that's the way that I did it. Is that going to work for everybody? I don't know. Uh, it just, it's just what I did and what worked. So are you saying that that first story you did that sold 10,000 copies in the first day, it was only 10,000 words? No. So that was uh, – um, so when I launched the book, actually, I had already – I went and put uh, each one of those short stories. I put them all separately. Um, so each one of the short – I had five short stories and then one 
sort of a novel length book and they were all tied together and so I put each one of those five short stories I put them on Amazon at 99 cents then put the the final story at 2.99 and then uh, and then I had the whole thing selling for 2.99 so people would look at it and say I could buy if I go one story at a time it's going to cost me eight dollars but then if I buy it all in one shot it's going to cost 2.99 and so then I had so each one of the the individual short stories were on published about the couple of weeks before um, but then I actually but I, that was all leading up to the launch day for Atopia. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. yeah. I was kind of creating a structure, and then then once the thing once Atopia was launched, I took each one of those individual short stories and made them free for one weekend, then the next weekend, then the next weekend, then the next weekend. So people would download the free book and then see that they could buy all of the whole thing of it together for two ninety nine, and it created a funnel into people buying the full book, and it created this perceived value also. So. It was a little bit of, you know, there's a bit of structure, it was a little bit clever, but it actually worked out pretty well. Okay, I've got a few questions. Um, whenever you sent the email to your Facebook and LinkedIn contacts, yeah, was that for the two ninety nine omnibus or the one of the ninety nine cent short stories? That was for the omnibus. Yeah, so I, that was I was sending it for the for the whole omnibus. But for the first weekend, I priced the omnibus at ninety nine cents also. So it's like First week when people look at it, they've got all these short stories and all this stuff, and it's all you know, eight dollars for the whole thing, and then or you could buy the omnibus for ninety nine cents. And so I was trying to create this perceived value. I mean, when you're starting out, you just want to, even if you give it away for free, if people would read it, you don't care. But I was trying to create this, you know, this uh, sort of a bigger thing with a funnel, and then you know, this perceived value at the end of it, and uh, people respond to that, you know. Gotcha. Um, do you think that serialization will work? as successfully now as it did then. The reason I ask is because I've heard Barry Eisler and Joe Conrath and Nathan Lowell, um, all those guys say that novels are where it's at. And just this past week I bought the omnibus, omnibus version of Sand. But as part of that I went and looked at the episodes that he sells for 99 cents. On the first episode he says, hey, just to let you know this is going to be collected into a single novel at the end of whenever I finish serializing it. Uh, yeah. And it, it makes me think that people prefer the having the entire story. But um, for a new people, author starting off, what would you recommend they do? People definitely prefer it. Novels are definitely where it's at. You know, short stories people have much less interest in. But if you're starting out as a writer, um, I think that, like I said, people's attention spans are so short and... You know, they've got so much free content. You need to, to get something to hook them in, like a, you know, a complete story, get their attention, get them to start trusting you. And I think, I think once you're, like, now that I got people's attention, I wouldn't go the serialization thing. I'd go just with novels because that's, that's what people want. But when you're just starting to try and get that attention, I think serializing is, is the way to go. Uh, you know, like I said, I just, it worked for me, so I'm... I, I'm very aware of the fact that there's so many, like in the world of business, people have success and they say, this is the only way you should do it because this is what worked. Yeah, but it could work a million different ways probably. I know that for myself and for Hugh also, it worked when we started out. And I think it, it, there's, some rationalizing, there's some rationalizations about why it worked that I could make that people have short attention spans. And so, so take all that with a grain of salt and say, yes, this is a way that has worked and there's a bunch of reasons why it might work. But it, you need to transition from that as quickly as you can into a full novel because that's what people do want. But it's it's a way of it's a it's one way of getting started. And historically, uh, in science fiction specifically, but even fantasy to some extent, back in you know the sixties and seventies, that's where a lot of authors got their starts having short stories yeah. and novellas published. Yeah. Uh, people forget that you know these big names like Stephen King and um, George R. R. Martin. George R. R. Martin won Hugo Awards for short stories and novellas, you know, 20, 30 years before he started writing 1,000-page novels. That's, that's exactly, you, you, need to get, you need to get people's trust and attention before you can start to hit them with the big novels. And so you might love all these big novels, and that's what you want to write, but to start off with, you need to, you, need to, you know, to, to start to get attention and start to get some trust and start to get a relationship with readers, you know? So it's a good point. Yeah, great point. Go ahead, Kevin. All right. Oh, no, weren't you going to ask about the website, Wade? <laughs> well, um, yeah, just uh, I know we're looking at your website and stuff, and 
hadn't seen a lot of blog posting and stuff like that. Do you use that at all to, to garner readers, or is that are you directing more of that towards writers? That's the post I saw. Uh, yeah, that's not really. I haven't I haven't been able to uh, to develop a relationship with the readers through the blog stuff. That was more for the writers, um, and and just if I. Like I did some, st I, I did a story for a NASA magazine talking about the merger between space and cyberspace, and so I post that up as a story. And um, uh, you know, I've, so I've been, I haven't been putting a lot of time into that. Like I said, I haven't really figured out my online strategy, and I think, um, you know, I've, I, the thing is, I've had good success at getting readers through the Amazon system, and that's all working for me. So I haven't really had the pressure to try and. To develop, you know, uh, uh, you know, a big readership base for my blog or all that sort of stuff. So I sort of keep up a, a minimum presence on there, but it's not something I focus on to to try and get readers. Well, a little side note here, but what's your what's your typical writing day and stuff look like? Because it sounds like you do have a lot of irons in the fire. So I mean, how much time are you spending writing each day versus doing other stuff? Um, when I'm in writing mode, and for the last month I haven't been in writing mode for a few reasons, but uh, when I'm in writing mode, I usually try and get up at, uh, I try to get up as early as possible. I find that writing from like 6 or 7 in the morning until noon is, is the prime writing time. Um, your brain's the most awake, I find the most creativity, all that stuff is kind of firing, and by the time I get to the early afternoon, it just sort of fizzles out, and my motivation goes, and then I usually do, uh, you know, emails and, and more mechanical administrative stuff in the in the afternoon, and then maybe go to the gym or something. Um, so really, when I'm writing, I try to um, I try to, uh, to to do it in the morning. And I've also been playing with gamifying my life a little bit, like saying, you know, if you get up at a certain time, I'll give my, you know, like a, trying to set some goals and, and trying to always get up, you know, try to get up by six o'clock, try to get a thousand words written before, you know, ten o'clock. Um, try to you know try and hit some of those uh, hit some of those type of goals and also keeping in a good mental state like just keeping fit and getting making sure you get sleep and all that sort of stuff is really key for me when I'm um, trying to do some good writing if you're if you're not aware if you're not if you're not very if you haven't slept well and you're not feeling physically fit and all that sort of stuff it will tend to or it tends to drag down my writing I don't feel motivated and uh, excited about it. Uh, and so that's just something I try to, to try to keep going. That's interesting. That's the first time I ever heard heard that bit of advice, but it, on here, but it really does fit. That's ex that's excellent. Kevin, you had a question about mailing lists. Yes, at the back matter of your book, you said that you put um, a note in about if you like this book, please leave a review. Do you also at the end add a thing, please sign up for my mailing list, or are you a big mailing list person in general? Um, and if you uh, are, then how do you use it? <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, I've got about a uh, thousand odd people on my uh, advanced reading beta list, whatever um, you know, mailing list, let's call it. Um, and uh, one of the most interesting ways, actually, I did something that I don't think any, I don't know anybody else has done, but <laughs> actually, I had all these people on my mailing list, and I and I emailed them and I said, hey, if you'd be willing willing to let me interview you about your life. Um, send me an email back and tell me, you know, how many kids you have, what you do for work, what your passions are. So I had all these people, I had about three or 400 people email me back, and I put it all into a database, and when I'm writing my new book, I said, well, I need a special forces, I need to somebody who's in special forces. I went to my database, I had five or six guys who are in special forces, I emailed them and said, could you give me some, some anecdotes about what you did in special forces when you went for training and all this stuff, then I folded that into my book, and so now I'm now I've got this database of all these people that, you know, I have another one of my characters in foster care, and I've got two people that run a foster care network, so I'm able to, I'm able to actually use that database to be able to interview people and then get stories from, from my readers that I'm able to fold into the books, and that's been super powerful. It's really, it's really fun to do, um, and that's, and then I also use those readers to do, uh, to do the um, beta reading and give me the crowdsource content edit. Um, it's just just amazingly powerful when you use when you use you know you use your readership base in that way. It's amazing. Awesome, Carl. You got some yeah. stuff. Um, I'm just double checking to see if there's any more questions. It doesn't seem that there are. There's a lot of discussion there um, on the website, and we did start late, but we have almost come up on an hour. Um, do any of you have any more questions for Matthew, or do you have anything, Matthew, that you wanted to cover that you haven't got to? 
Uh, no, I didn't. I don't think I had any uh, any questions for you guys. It, it's really interesting to be able to talk to to fellow authors and to have this type of uh, you know a lot of writing is spent you know in a room by yourself, <laughs> wondering you know if the world will ever listen or, or you know hear you. So it, it is really it's really great to be able to to uh, to, to have this type of uh, you know have the type of discussion. I mean I mean I'm interested in in hearing about some of your experiences as well with. With writing and what you've been doing with you know uh, with books and, and and just you know I'm just really interested in what other people are doing because there is a lot of I spend a lot of time by myself <laughs> so <laughs> yes <laughs> it's nice to actually have some social interaction with other writers <laughs> yeah well the, actually if talk about social interaction we usually have a little after party after these and that's a lot of times the conversations get very interesting so maybe if you get a chance yeah, to watch maybe. another show or whatever or today you can pop I in I don't know if you have yeah if you have a, a few minutes afterwards we after the live hangout we do a offline hangout and invite some of the live viewers in to ask more questions and have a chat so if you're interested we'll be doing that yeah I I, I can do it for a few minutes but I got my yeah. family waiting upstairs for dinner and it's 1030 so yeah. Oh, you oh, a late yeah. dinner. That's a late dinner. <laughs> it's a late dinner, yeah. It's a late dinner, but yeah, I've got to, I, I probably should should get up there. Um, so sorry. that's fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are a couple of admin things uh, that I wanted to talk about before we wrap up. Um, the first is with the blog on the Self Publishing Roundtable website. Uh, we're starting to ramp up some of the content there, and Kevin is starting a series of author interviews. Um, obviously, we interview or discuss uh, with interview uh, authors every week on the sh show live, but there's various reasons why some people can't do the hangout. It might be the time. Um, they might be frightened of speaking on camera. Uh, some frightened people of aren't. you, Carl, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> some, people, some people just don't feel comfortable getting in front of a camera, uh, but there's a lot of stories out there from a lot of successful people that we think are worthwhile sharing, so Kevin's... Uh, in the process of doing a bunch of those interviews, and some of them. Will, when's the first one going to be up, Kevin? We've done it already. It's actually up. It's actually currently up. I just put it in the comments. It is with uh, best-selling paranormal author Rebecca Hamilton. Um, she wrote a, a dark um, paranormal book, and she has a film deal, and she got a traditional publisher out of it also. Same. So head over there. Um, we're going to have some other content coming there, uh, Kevin and. I and Trish and John and Wade uh, will be working on that and we'll be talking about some other ideas that we can do. Um, now, Trish isn't here because of technical difficulties and she was traveling, but Dave isn't here because he's actually leaving the show uh, for the time being anyway. Um, you got to ten people in his dungeon. There's yeah, the no. <laughs> Dave couldn't be here to sort of say it himself, but uh, it kind of come up during the week. He's got a hell of a lot on at the moment, uh, both work-wise and family-wise. Um, it's the summer now. Uh, he's got a son uh, to deal with, and he's also got a bunch of work to do. You may have heard of a little thing called Fiction Unboxed. Uh, he's doing a fair bit of work with uh, Johnny and Sean, and he's got a bunch of stuff for the collective ink well. So he's going to be back um, on and off in the future, but as a permanent weekly thing, he won't be. But I think everyone uh, can learn from tonight that Kevin's uh, filled in very well, and I think he's going to be an excellent addition to the site and the blog, and he's done some great work for us already on the blog in the past, so we're really happy to have Kevin here. Yes, Kevin, definitely. You demand. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. So should I just stay on here then for a couple of minutes? I'll just tell them to, to get dinner going and I'll come down and we'll have okay. a chat then. Yeah. So I just stay. Sorry. I just uh, do. I don't have to do anything. I just have to stay on. Yeah, yeah. You just leave it on. Uh, that's fine. Uh, so if anyone um, is interested in anything else that they might like to see on the blog or from us, please send us an email on the contact form on the website because we are um, starting to really do stuff with that and uh, we're looking to involve you guys out there in the community. So if you want an after party um, invite, please reply to Kevin. As always, we would appreciate if you could uh, consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We've got quite a few over there now, but it really helps us um, build the show and the brand, and we love you guys, so it'd be cool if you can go and do that for us. Anyone have anything else to say? John? Thanks for watching. Uh, thank, thank, yeah, thank you very much, guys. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Matt. That was, yeah, 
Pleasure. It was a great, great interview. So. Okay. Good. Good night, everyone. Yeah. No worries. Good night, everyone, and the invites will come out shortly from Kevin. So we'll see you soon. See you next it's week. It's remarkable reads. In case you guys don't know my actual name. Yeah. Right. Wait, how are your moms for me? <laughs> oh, uh, before we go, wait, did you did you like my intro last week? Yeah, were... I loved it. Yeah, we were, I'd say we're like, uh, you know, like the Wonder Twins, right? We're connected. <laughs> yeah, I was, going to, uh, I was going to actually start doing my Wade uh, Finnegan impression, but I got warned by Trish not to. So. Oh, <laughs> Trish is looking out for me. She's like mothering you. I love it. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye.